Yes. You were right and I was wrong. I can't repay all the love you've given me. Amen, sister. You were my friend when no one cared. I was alone, but you were there. Lord, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. Amen. I owe it all to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All I have is yours, Lord. Take my life and make me what you have me be. All right. I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing. Amen. Amen, sister. Borrowed treasures and borrowed dreams. All I've enjoyed is given me. When troubles come, you're always there to make me smile. Amen. Let come what may, the will be done. I love you, Jesus. Amen. God's only son. Lord, you're the best thing Amen. that ever happened to me. And he is. He's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. I love him. I don't live like I should all the time. I make many mistakes, but I'm glad that he forgives me. Oh, yeah. That's right. Amen. Oh, what would I do if I didn't have him? Where would I be? Praise the Lord, sister. Oh, thank you for everything he said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, I might be out of line. I wouldn't embarrass nobody, but Sister Lorraine, would you come and play Amazing Grace for us on the piano? Amen. They should be. I just felt led to ask her to do that. Do I know how to turn it on? If I don't, Randor. I didn't know we had a button to turn it on. <laughs> Does it got a button to turn it on? Yeah. Is that it right there? Caleb knows how. Turn that on in the corner? Yeah. Push that button. Help yeah. hey, us. I just felt led and asked the Lord, ask her to do that. How many of you appreciate Amazing Grace? <laughs> I sure appreciate it. How many of you needed Amazing Grace? I needed it in 1993. I needed it in 1993. And I need it right now. I need it right now. Amen.
sister. Praise his holy name. I appreciate that. I just, amen. Sometimes it's just good, ain't it? Thank you, Jesus. Hannah, come sing this one, honey. I hold it up. to give up so I'm bringing you my dry bones breathing me again I need that wind to start blowing I need that light to be open I need my heart to cry so I'm calling out I need a revival first time when the words in the Bible jumped right off the page a new beginning a new life I felt the joy of my salvation won't you take me there take me there today the 
first time when the words in the Bible jumped right off the page a new beginning a new life I felt the joy of my salvation won't you take me take me there today I need a revival feel you moving in my soul give me that fire I haven't felt in far too long Holy Ghost come awaken take me back to the days when wonder working alive in me oh I need a revival oh I need a revival I need a revival feel you moving in my far too long Holy Ghost come awaken take me back to those days when wonder working power was alive in me oh I need a revival Pray for Brandon. He's going to bring us a message. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This was good. Praise the Lord. Amen. I was up with Brother Ronnie Matney's other night, and he... Uh, Brother Sean was taking prayer requests and Brother Ronnie said we need revival and he, he let that rest for a minute and then he said nothing else will do right nothing else I don't know anything else do you nobody politicians ain't doing it no 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 uh, patriotism ain't doing it the school systems ain't doing it. We ain't got enough money to fix it. We need revival. Amen. Nothing else will do. Right, Brandon. 39,255 adult men in the United States last year killed themselves. Whether it was with a gun or with a rope. What What is making almost 40,000 men get to the place where there ain't nothing to live for? Oh, my goodness. Need revival. Right. There's about 11,000 women in the United States that took their lives. What make them get to that place? Need revival. When you get to where you don't have no hope, you don't have nothing. Because hope is what you have when you don't have anything. That's right. So if you lose your hope, you, you're as good as dead. That's right, right. Paul said, if I had hope only in this life, right. I'd be of all men most miserable. Right. I've, got a, I've got a revival message this morning. All right. And uh, I want to ask my wife when I get ready to do the altar to come back and sing that song. This isn't going to be an altar call where everybody's going to flood the altars because it's going to be one of those altar calls where you're going to feel like you're pointed out. You ever had an altar call like that? Mm -hmm. Where everybody's waiting on the other person to go first, that way you can go? I feel like that's how it'll be um, if you've got your Bibles. I've done preached this to myself three times, and I had to pray all three times. So if you don't have to pray this morning, you're a lot better person than I've ever been. Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. Thank you. 
Matthew chapter number 7, if you stand when you have it. Matthew 7, chapter chapter 7. I've never preached on these verses. I was praying that God would give me something for Antioch. Uh, Brother Jason asked me a few days ago, and I tried to be specific. God, give me something for Antioch, and God gave me something for me. Um, but I think it will help you too. Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Look at, look at the first verse again. Now this is in red. Judge not that ye be not judged. If you'd lift up your hands just for a minute, ask God to help us. Lord, we love you. Appreciate God, in you. Jesus' name. Thank you for this service. Give another opportunity, to Lord, to read your word. God, give me the God, and help me to preach. Of pray your pray word. that you bring this word out, Lord. Oh, God, tonight. God, help Jesus somebody. Name. We want revival, Lord. Holy Ghost, Lord. I need it in my life. I need it in my home. God. We need it in our nation, Lord. I pray you'd move, God, God and, and, and that this would Thank penetrate you. this Thank morning. Jesus. In Jesus' name. Thank you can be you. seated. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm going to take my time and go slow. There is nothing, nothing. I've been examining it for days. There's nothing that affects our church any more than this. Right. Not drugs, not alcohol, just judging. So I want to preach on just those first two words, judge not. All right. And Jesus is talking to his church members and his disciples and he's not, he's not saying this, that you can't judge a man by the life that they're living. He said, by their fruits you shall know them. And the Bible's not contradictory. That's how we know that if somebody's saved, if they live like a Christian, we can look at them and say, well, they must be living right. And the Bible says, know them that labor among you. So it's good to know if somebody's living for the Lord and they're doing things right. And it's also good to know if somebody ain't living right. I mean, if somebody's out living in sin and they're coming to church, church and maybe putting on a front. I don't want my kids around that person outside of church. I don't want bad influences in my family. So it's good to know if someone's a Christian or not. But what's wrong is you can judge somebody based on this book. But Jesus is trying to say don't judge them based on your life. Right. You know what I do so often? I judge people based on how Brandon lives. Yeah. And I don't judge them based on the word of God but I judge them based on my life and my marriage and my ministry and if it don't line up with what I think then it's wrong and all of you are just as guilty as I am this is the number one thing that keeps division in our churches that's why when we have fellowships nobody does nothing when we have revival it takes a week and a half for everybody to be comfortable because we've judged all week and there's people that we've got things against judging is the number one thing that God is displeased with in his church he said, judge not that you be not judged. And with what measure you meet out, it'll be measured to you again. Now, you ever judge somebody about something and a few weeks or a few months pass and the very thing that you had condemned somebody for, it had came right back around and manifested in your own life. Have you ever done that before? There's people right now that'll judge men and judge women for running around on their spouse and, and cheating, maybe caught in temptation and left out one time and now they're wanting to make things right and people will judge them and the very man that is casting the judgment is addicted to pornography and living like hell but he's casting judgment because something he's got right and his brother's got wrong. He's deciding to judge him in that aspect. Now, I don't, I don't judge people on things that I do wrong. I keep those out. I only judge people on the things I do right. I've, I've never had a problem with, with cussing since I got saved. I've heard men, though, that I've got confidence in said that there's been a few times they've got real angry and they've, they've slipped up, Brother Jason, and cussed. And uh, to me, that just seems wild because it's not even a temptation I have. But the things that I fight are things that they don't fight. And because we're strong in some places and others are weak, we'll take our lot and cast judgment. That's why Paul said it's 
unwise to compare yourself among yourselves because everybody has got different strengths and different weaknesses and you can't go around comparing everybody all the time or nobody will ever live good enough for you. Now, churches are the worst. Church people are the worst. A sinner could care less what you're doing. They don't care what you're doing. They're lost. They're just worried about their sin. All the judgment comes from the church people. And the Bible said that there was two men, Jesus said. He said there was a, there was a righteous man, not a righteous man, a religious man. And it said that he went down to the altar and he stood up really pious and he prayed, Lord, thank you that I'm not like all of these sinners. And thank you that I'm not like all these other people. And he said there was a sinner, a soldier that went down and smote his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said that man left more justified than the church fan, the, the, the church man. If we've just got religion, we'll miss it all because religion is not righteousness. They're two completely different things. So Jesus said, judge not because if you do, judgment will come back your way. Now, there was, there was a, well, we read about Jonah. And God told Jonah to go down to Nineveh and to preach the gospel. And Jonah didn't want to do that. And Jonah ran from the call of God and was living in all kinds of rebellion. And it wasn't until he was swallowed up in the belly of that whale before he actually got to a place when he was down in the belly of the whale to where he repented. And finally he got up and he went to Nineveh and he preached what God had bid him to preach. And the Bible said that he went and sat on a hillside and God made a gourd come up to keep him shaded from that hot sun. And he sat there and watched what was gonna happen to those Ninevites, every one of them. They went on a fast. The king said, don't let your cattle eat. Don't let your horses eat. Don't let your children eat. We're going to fast. Who knows whether God will have mercy on us. And Jonah was sitting on the hillside with his arms crossed, waiting for the judgment of God to come down. And the next morning, the Bible said that God sent a worm to eat that gourd, and it was gone. And Jonah got mad and started to complain to God that he had took away his gourd. And God said, you've had more compassion on this gourd than you did the Ninevites. Judgment. That's right. That's exactly what he was. Judgment. He was judging the way Nineveh was living and saying there's no way that these people can make it out of God's judgment. But that gourd that had never done anything right or wrong, he had compassion on that gourd. You know a lot of times we got compassion on things that help us. Yes. Right. Amen. Yes. You'll have compassion on your wife and on your husband and on your kids. That's right. And, uh, but if it ain't your kids and your family, you don't have no compassion passion on them. You ain't got no connection with them. If it ain't doing you no good, then you don't get nothing from it. I see that in my generation. If we can't get something from it, I don't want to do it. If I can't get a fix out of it, I don't want to do it. But church ought not to be that way. That's why Jesus said we've got to stop all of this judging. Amen. Now, there was a, there was a, a um, someone in church not this church, but someone in church that I, I had a I had something happen and it just it bothered me and I got mad and I said some things and they got mad and they said some things and uh, it's been probably a year and I've ran into this person several times in church meetings and because I have judged them every time they come in I feel like they're judging me. Yeah. Is this am I doing okay? Oh, yeah. Every time they come in, I feel like they're judging me. You know why I feel that way? Because I've been judging them. And surely if I'm judging them, they're judging me. And every time that we've been in meeting together, it's just, it's felt awkward. And I felt like they were in the wrong and they felt like I was in the wrong. And finally, a few weeks ago, I just went to them and I said, whatever I did, I'm sorry. Any way that I acted wrong, I'm sorry because I realize we're gonna be around each other and I don't want this judging spirit among us when we come in meeting together. The worst thing you can do to hinder a meeting is to judge people. That's why I said in revival, you got other churches coming. 
coming in and everybody's judging and you've heard this story and you've heard that story and it seems like we can't get in. You'd be a whole lot better off if you'd focus on yourself and your house and quit worrying about everybody else and maybe you could get in the blessings of God and actually see revival in your home and worry about your kids that are living like hell instead of everybody else's. Maybe they'd get saved if mommy and daddy would get their nose in their own business. I'm just as guilty. I'm just as guilty. But we've got to put first things first. And your family and your children and your church ought to be above everything else. Yes. Good. Now, how many of you have ever at this church you've been out and somebody talk about somebody at this church? Oh, yeah. How does that make you feel? Does it make you aggravated? Or do you jump in on it with them? And then you come in church and that's why you can't get in meeting. And that person ain't never done nothing to you but you can't, you can't get along with them. We've got to stop this judging. The Bible said, everybody knows the story of David and Bathsheba. Brother Jason quoted it and talked about it. But David was living in a life of sin and I guess you could say he might have put his adultery and murder, maybe he put it all behind him but he still had a judging spirit in him. I'm gonna show you this in the scriptures of somebody carrying a judgmental spirit. They don't, they don't do nothing right. You do everything right, they do everything wrong. It don't matter how they preach, how they sing, you've got something to say. It don't matter what they do, you've got to find something wrong with it. That is a judgmental spirit straight out of hell and you need to ask God to give you deliverance from it this morning. I've seen more than once it gets on me and I want to judge people. You better rebuke that in the name of Jesus and ask God for deliverance. <laughs> Amen. There was David sitting on his throne. Nathan the prophet comes down. And I heard this story kind of in detail one time by a preacher. And that's how I'm going to tell it to you. But Nathan the prophet came down. And just walk along with me here. He came down and the servants went to David and said, Nathan the prophet, he's here to talk to you. And David loved Nathan the prophet. He said, bring him on in. He's God's man. And he came in and David said, what can I do for you, Nathan? And Nathan said, I've got something I want to tell you about that's been bothering me. He said, okay, go ahead and, and give it to me. And Nathan said, well, down the road there is a rich man. He lives right on the edge of town. And he's got so much cattle and so much land and so many servants and big nice houses and everything he could ask for and about two miles down the road right on the outskirts of town there's a little poor man and he don't have nothing but a little shack he's got his wife and his kids and they've got a little ewe lamb and they've dedicated their lives to taking care of that little ewe lamb they've fed it they've house broke it it's been just like a kid to them. They've took care of it and loved it. And this rich man, just the other day, he had some friends come from out of town and he wanted to make his friends a feast. Now David's following along in the story just like you are. Amen, that's right. He's listening to God's man. He's a rich man. He's got a lot. He's a poor man. He don't have nothing but a little lamb. And the rich man had some visitors come in. Yeah, I'm with you. And Nathan says, he said, the rich man wanted to have a dinner for these visitors. And he told his servants, I want you to go down to that poor man's house and take that little ewe lamb and bring him up here and sacrifice him to feed him unto my visitors. And as, you, as, as the servants would, they went down and David's blood is already starting to boil because even though that he wasn't living like he was supposed to, that book was still in him. And how many of you can testify and say, even when you get away from God, if you've ever really had it, it's still in you. You just remember it. And you, you remember what it tastes like and what it felt like. And it's still in you, even though you might not be living right, you know what is right. And David may have not been living right, but he knew what was right. David's getting aggravated. Right. He said he, he went, hold on, tell me again. He went down, he had, he's got all these cattle and he's got all this land and he's got all kinds of lambs that he could have took for dinner for his visitors and he went down to the poor man's house to get his lamb. Nathan said, yeah, he sent his servants down to the poor man's house. And if you can go along with me again, in my imagination, you can see this servant, these servants of the king going down and... 
just a little old shack. And, uh, and maybe the, the daddy runs to the door and opens it up and sees it's the king's servants and says, what is it? Anything it is. Whatever we can help you with, what does the king need? And they said, well, actually, the king has sent us down here to get that little ewe lamb, that lamb that was maybe out back playing with the kids that they had nursed. And I feel like the man may have said, okay, take the lamb to the king. Show him, let him, let him. If he wants to take him as a pet, whatever it is. And the servant said, no, the the, the rich man's got some visitors and he's wanting to sacrifice that little you lamb. Amen. Now, judgmental spirit, stay with me. Yes. And the daddy says, no, no. I have, I, we, have, we have sunk a lot of time into this little lamb. And, uh, and that rich man, he's got, he's got all kinds of, he's got all kinds of cattle and my children play with this lamb. And he stays in the house and we've nursed it just like a child. And maybe at this time, mommy and the kids has overheard the conversation and the kids are starting to cry because they know that their little lamb is about to be taken. Amen. That's good preaching. But the king had called for it, so he sent it away. Maybe the kids and the family stood in the yard, watched the servant pack it off while they was all crying. I mean, you know how you get close to things, don't you? And when you get close to something, you don't want it to leave. And by this time, David is as mad as he could possibly be. And he said, I want you to tell me where this man's at. And we're going to go execute judgment on this man because what he did wasn't right. And Nathan went right back at him and said, David, thou art the man. He said, you've had wives, you've had kingdoms, and God surely would have gave you more if you asked. And Uriah had one little you lamb, and you went out of your way to take it from him. You're the man, David. Yes. Judgmental spirit. Amen. That's all it does. You've got to watch a judgmental spirit because you'll find out the very things you're judging people for, you're doing them. And just because you're cold don't mean everybody else in the church is. Can you amen that? Just because you're not where you need to be with God don't mean everybody else is lost. And I've did it myself. But there's been people that's spiritual in the church and in dead services to me, they'll get up and praise God. There's been times I've not feel a thing not feel a thing and sister Sharon get up and start running and shouting I know she ain't faking I know it's real but there's something in me because I'm not where I need to be I know y'all ain't like this but we're, we're, I'm not where I need to be and I start to say I wonder if that's real I mean I wonder if that's real nobody else might, I done told you I prayed three times about this I'm really bad for this stuff I, I, I get to wondering things like that judgmental spirit see when you're super for spiritual than everybody else can be. But if you're cold and not living right, then for some reason you think everybody else is living like hell. But that ain't the case. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. Whatever you measure out, it'll be met back unto you again. 